is a junior, DOC number is 556263. All right, Mr. Elsey. So you are classified as a first felony offender. You were sentenced September 8, 2009 for a conviction of forcible rape. You received a 13-year sentence in the Department of Corrections. Your parole eligibility date is September 6, 2020. You don't earn good time because of the nature of your offense, and your full term date is August 18, 2022. Is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. So uh, as I reviewed your record, uh, Mr. Elsey, I noticed that you um, have, have been participating in some programs. But what concerned me is uh, that you've only completed, recently completed phase one of the sex offender treatment program. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And are you, enro are you enrolled in that program now? Yes, I'm cur uh, currently enrolled. Uh, we was at the uh, currently at the end of uh, phase two when the uh, COVID-19 pandemic started and they shut down the classes, which uh, I probably would have completed all three phases uh, by now if you know the classes had continued. Right. So, so they've suspended the classes because of the COVID, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, you, you need to be aware, and let me get to that page. You were how old at the time of this offense? Uh, 40, 49. Mm -hmm. And the victim in this offense was your girlfriend? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. As part of the process uh, in preparing for a parole consideration hearing, we reach out to uh, the community to determine their attitude and their what their thoughts are about an early release. And in your case, uh, we received uh, opposition from the district attorney's office. We received opposition from the sheriff's office. We um, received opposition from the Ponchatoula Police Department. Um, and so, in, you know, there's nothing you can really do about that, Mr. Elsey. But tell us why you believe that we should grant you an early release. Well, the reason I say that I deserve an early release is because of the fact that at the time, uh, this is more than just a 11 year sentence that I've been on. It's been like 17 years. Uh, this took place in 2003. I was on bond for six years and I ran for city councilman during that time against say incumbent and won a council seat as well that became mayor pro tem. I have always served and been part of the community and doing positive things. Uh, and I say this because the fact that my family are all educators uh, my mother and my father raised six children, and we all are college educated, and we all have degrees, and five went into education, and one went into the health service and became a nurse. They taught us to serve others, and that's what we have always done. And my own personal reason that I deserve this, because I am a first-time offender, and for 17 years that myself and my family have been dealing with this. And if I could be on bond for six years, I know I could be on parole for two years. And I just say that I deserve that opportunity. And I have shown that here at RCC with my behavior and all that I have participated in to make and show that I deserve opportunity to go home and be with my family and loved ones and have opportunity to give back to the community and give back to my family. I want to uh, also say I'm very sorry to the victim and all that was involved in this conviction. I totally apologize for that. 
we call it, of my making a decision that wasn't part of me. And I just want to have the opportunity to get back to my mother, who is 88 years old, who have been traveling these highways and byways for 11 years. They show my love, they show love and support of me, and they have never wavered for me. So I truly know who is there to love and support me. You know, so. Uh, well, I appreciate everything you said, Mr. Elsie. Let me tell you what concerns me. And I do show in the record the you know, the programs that you've participated in, a lot of faith-based programs and so forth. The, the lack of uh, completion of sex offender treatment is what concerns me. Uh, I hear what you're saying about being on bond for six years, but when I look at the facts of the case and the violent nature of what happened and the what's in the record uh, indicates that this didn't this is not the first time this happened, that this was a game that you and your co-defendant played. Uh, and it happened to numerous female victims. That's concerning to me. And lacking the sex offender therapy and treatment, I don't feel comfortable allowing you to do what you're asking us to do today. So with that said, I'm gonna to defer to my colleagues for their comments or questions. Mr. Roche? Yes, I only have one question. Mr. Elsie, good morning. Good morning. Is it not true that you were charged with two rapes and the second rape was no billed at the time that you were sentenced. I'm not aware of me being charged with no two rapes, sir. Um, only, only rape that I'm familiar with being charged is the one that I'm currently uh, doing time on now. Okay. And at the time you were sentenced, it was a second rape that involved a 13 year old girl that you, that the DA no build, which meant that you were not um, sentenced, but you were charged with that offense. Is that correct? Yes or no? My answer to that is no, sir, because- Thank you, sir. Okay. Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Mr. Jones. I don't have any questions for Mr. Elson. Okay. Um, let's hear from uh, Miss Yvonne Elsie. Ma'am, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, I'm Yvonne Elsie. I'm Robert's mother. And I thank you all, grateful from the bottom of my heart, for you having me to come and speak for my son, Robert. To me, Robert, he is special to the entire family. And we would love for him to be home with us, with the family. Through the years, we have gone to church each Sunday morning. He'll take me, he and I will go to Sunday school and church. And he was a member of the church. He was a trustee and he paid his tithes and offerings and service to the church. And I'm asking you, please, please, let him come and be with his family again. And we appreciate so much, so much, so much for y'all's care and kindness and love and devotion that you have shown to him and my entire family. We would love for him to be with us on holidays and with his family. 
to show him the special love we have for him. We miss him so much. Every day, he would ask me, Mama, do you need anything? Are you wanting anything? Or do you need me to take you in place? And I was so appreciative of that. He kept my lawn mowed. And he would check with me on the third and eighth. And I remember my refrigerator had stopped overnight the next, the next morning. Uh, all my food and everything was ruined. And Robert came and he told me that he would purchase me another refrigerator. And he went and had a refrigerator delivered to my home. And I'm just so thankful and grateful for all his kindness and love ways he has shown throughout. Thank, thank you, Ms. Elsie. Thank you. Thank you so much. We do appreciate you participating with us this morning. Um, we're going to ask at this time, we'll ask Warden Tanner for his uh, input. Yes, ma'am. Um, Robert's, uh, he's, I hesitate to use the word model, but he's pretty, pretty close to a, a model prisoner in that he's, uh, participated in the programming. Uh, I'm a little concerned that he didn't get on to and uh, in, in start participating in the sex offender treatment program earlier in his um, in his stay. Um, but he has participated in programming and served. Um, at one point, we had a, a wellness program and he was the uh, a facilitator in that program. Uh, I inquired with him as to why he didn't uh, serve as an educator here. And he said that he felt like that there were guys that were capable of doing the job and that they needed the, the, the funds that they could earn by being an educator more than he. And so he allowed them that opportunity. Um, I would just point out, you know, he, he is a, will full term on August the 18th, 2022. Um, you know, he has low Lorner's, uh, I'm sorry, low um, Tiger scores and um, supervision would, uh, would allow the board the opportunity, his parole would allow the board the opportunity okay. to release him with conditions that the, that the board could, uh, could monitor him a little bit better during that two years, I guess. Just the thought. Um, in, in, member of the inmate recognition program, good conduct record. I have no problems with uh, Robert Elsey's institutional record. Other than Thank you, Warden was. Tanner. Yeah. We, we so appreciate your input. I think that uh, Ms. Gayran has uh, We'll, we'll speak on behalf of the victim, Ms. Ms. Uh, Jewel McCoy, Ms. Gayran. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah. Well, first of all, the victim did not want to appear on the video, but she asked that um, the offender be informed that he has caused a great deal of hurt to her and that she hopes that he realizes that. Um, she said if he would be released, she'd like to request that Mr. Elsey um, have stipulations that he will have no personal contact with her. Also, that if they are ever um, end up in the same location, that he would immediately leave because she felt like this would be too traumatizing for her. And she just said, thank you for your consideration. Thank you. We appreciate you representing Ms. McCoy. Mr. Elsey, is there a statement you'd like to make? 
Yes, ma'am. Um, like I said, I'm very sorry uh, for the incident. And I just want to say that uh, the other perpetrator that was in this uh, conviction and this crime, he has been released, went home, got arrested again, and been released. And so I understand, you know, what was said or what's in the minutes. My only regret, I didn't testify and I should have. And I think uh, this would have, you know, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at today. But because of that fact, and like I said, I'm learning about information that I totally wasn't aware of. I'm sorry that, you know, things are being said or put into my jacket that I have never been told of. And I regret, like I said, I'm very, I regret that my mother has to come out during this COVID-19 and speak on my behalf. And I regret the fact that I have hurt people that had a lot of trust in me. And I just want to say that, and I'm asking, I'm truly asking, I'm begging, to just give me an opportunity to come back to my family and to my community. And I promise you, y'all will never see my face on this side of the camera again. And I regret that I have to come to this now, you know, because we weren't raised that way. We were raised to serve and help others. And that's what I did all my adult life. And, and like I said, uh, I know things are put in there by some games we played and all that, but that's not so. But I don't want to go through that. And like I said, I just pray and ask that you all will give me an opportunity for these two years. It's not for two years. And whatever stipulations you want, I don't mind, you know, going through those stipulations on her behalf. I would do what it takes. Just give me an opportunity. That's all I ask. And I try to do everything I could while I'm behind this fence to show other guys doing the right thing. You have an opportunity and hope for coming up out of here. I've been that mall. And to send me back down that walk with a denial. A lot of guys are going to be hurt. A lot of security guards are going to be hurt. I'm just asking. And I'm with that, you know, that's all I can ask. Give me an opportunity. Let me ask you one more question, Mr. Elsey. Yes, ma'am. We mentioned and we talked about your participation in sex offender class, and you completed phase one in 2019, I believe, December. Was it 2019? Yes, ma'am. Why did you wait so long to do that? And the reason I waited, because at the time I was appealing my case. And by me appealing my case, I had talked to my attorney. He just said, well, you know, don't worry about it right now. But my attorney ended up dying. Uh, Mr. Duncan Kemp he ended up dying. And uh, I got another attorney. And you know how that go when you change attorneys? kind of like changing horses in the middle of the river. Uh, and that didn't turn out. So the person then, you know, put the effort in. But I have never tried to avoid that. I never thought that, if I thought that class would kept me from going home, yeah, I would have taken it. Nobody told me it was mandatory. Mm -hmm. Nobody told me that I had to definitely take this class in order to uh, be paroled. I was never told that, but I still took classes, you know, and without even receiving good time for them, you know, and and so that's the reason it was a delay because I had an attorney appealing my case, and uh, like I said, that attorney ended up passing, and I ended up getting another attorney, and mm -hmm. uh, that didn't phase okay. out. So. All right, I get it. Yes, ma'am. I understand. I understand. Is the panel prepared to vote? Yes. Yes. All right, I'll ask Mr. Roche to vote. 
Mr. LZ, I have read every letter of support that was submitted. We had 25 or 30 letters submitted by family, friends, mm -hmm. community leaders, politicians, saying that you are an upstanding individual. I've read every last one of those letters. But in my opinion, you have a flaw that allowed you to uh, be prey on innocent individuals. That flaw needs to be addressed completely before I vote to release you. As the chairman said that you could have taken sex offender treatment early in the game. It is not mandatory for release, but most members is desired before they release a sex offender. So based upon incomplete sex offender treatment, express opposition from the DA's office, the sheriff's office, and the chief of police, my vote is to deny your request. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Mr. Jones. Mr. Elsie, um, you may be the first inmate that, um, that has appeared before the board when I was on it, who told us a number of times that you deserve to be paroled. And, um, and we are not in the justice business, we're in the mercy business. People um, that we parole, uh, we may think that they've uh, done things to, to uh, help themselves and, um, and increase their chances of parole, but, but um, they don't deserve it. The, um, and, and many times you talk about things you regret and, and um, you, you're able to um, talk about things that you regret. Most of the things you regret is uh, the time you've served and its effect on others uh, rather than the crime you committed. Um, I, didn't, I didn't hear much of that, didn't hear any of that. Uh, but all that aside, I agree with Mr. Roche. Uh, I'm a lawyer and, and, uh, and, and your lawyer, Mr. Kemp would have told you that taking sex offender classes would never be admissible in a subsequent proceeding to make you look guiltier. It's not admissible that you took sex offender treatment. I find that excuse for not taking sex offender treatment to be pretty empty. Um, but given the crime, uh, I like Mr. Roche, uh, could not vote to grant you parole uh, because you have not, um, not only have you not completed sex offender treatment, you haven't completed sex offender treatment when you had abundant chances to do it. My vote is to deny your parole. And uh, I do concur with my colleagues. I've already mentioned that to you, uh, lacking uh, completion of all phases of the sex offender treatment. My vote today is to deny your parole. I did put a note on the uh, decision form that uh, should you have the opportunity to complete before your release date, you could always come back, reapply for another hearing. Uh, but today, sir, your parole has been denied. I wanna thank your family um, for, the, for their participation in today's proceedings. Good luck to you, Mr. Elsie. Yes, ma'am. I'll call you at a later at a later time today to sign your papers. Okay, okay then. You can go. Um, I think you got to wait until count clears, but go talk to the officer. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Now, let me unpack this for you. I had to listen to this twice, 
and then read over the documents that Richard provided multiple times because it was it was confusing. Uh, but I'll unpack it. So what happened? What happened was is that okay? So he he Robert was actually a a teacher. At, at a school and also a football and basketball coach when he initially met his co-defendant who he spoke about who testified against him his co-defendant was a student we're just getting into the backstory of how of how he met his co-defendant and that's just a red flag for me it's kind of scary he met his co-defendant while he was a coach and his co-defendant was a high school student eventually he graduated high school but they remained friends and it comes out that he and his friend, former student, would play this game. Now, what is this game? Well, this game was is that he would have his friend come over to his home. And then he would pretend to go to sleep while his friend would then assault the woman who was in a sexual nature so that he could watch or be in the room while it was happening. Now we don't exactly, I haven't seen evidence of how many times this happened, but we know that it happened to his, with his first wife, not the woman who this is about, not the victim who this is about in this hearing. It happened with his first wife in 1996. So he had gotten married to his first wife, invited his co-defendant over. He went, his wife went into the bedroom to go to sleep. The co-defendant went into the bed. She thought at first it was her husband when she realized it wasn't her husband, she started to fight back. Meanwhile, her husband is pretending to be asleep in the living room, with the, but the bedroom door is open. The wife at that time realizes the weapon, the gun they always kept in their drawer next to her was gone. And for some reason, I don't know why, but they had a switch in the bedroom that would also, that would trigger their house alarm. And that was turned off. When she, when he was done with the assault um her husband and he then he left the house this is the code defendant who testified against him uh then her husband came back and tried to engage in sexual activity and she explained what happened and he pretended to be shocked and 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 upset but when she tried to tell the police about it he got angry and and said you can't do it you can't report it and eventually it kind of dawned on her that, oh my gosh, this is uh this is what happened. He he set it up. And she did report it. And believe it, I wouldn't even say or not, because remember, this is also a different time in, in 1996 or 97 when but but a grand jury did not indict him. A grand jury heard the case and 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 for whatever reason said no. We don't think that it was uh, not consensual. Now, fast forward. He, it's now his second. It's his a girlfriend. They were talking about getting married. I don't think they were yet engaged. And they go out to a bar and he invites again his co-defendant. And it states here that she insisted, hey, I don't want him here. Why well, have it three wills? It's it's just me and you. But uh, they ended up hanging out, you know, whatever that. I mean, that happens all the time. It's not a huge deal where there's a third wheel. But when they were done with the bars, they went back home. And he went to bed while she was in the kitchen he went and sexually assaulted her 
And during the assault, she was, you know, screaming and all that. And he, uh, and he, again, pretended to be asleep and not know what was going on. And, and, and a similar situation played out, except that she seemed to immediately believe his girl, his fiance, his girlfriend, believe um, the victim of this that we're talking about seemed to put two and two together much faster and, um, and believe that she had, that he had set it up. And he actually said that night, you know, just admit it, you wanted it type of thing. And, um, but she ended up getting the whole kit done and getting DNA and, and then, and, and detectives came and, and it was at that point that, um, they were both indicted and that's where he goes and says my only which is just if it just shows what he's still like in denial he says my only mistake my only mistake was that i didn't testify my only regret my only regret is that i didn't testify i also regret that my mother has to travel and finally he said i regret about and he was like he really is still playing it out in his head that he did nothing wrong. Now, let's take it to the next level of how disturbing all of this is. His co-defendant, who they gave a deal to testify against him, and now there's always that's, you know, this way the system works. They needed someone to testify against the other person or... It, it probably would have gotten away with it without that if he hadn't taken the stand and said, hey, he, he has this fantasy about me doing this um, to a woman, and this is what he did. And he testified to exactly what had happened. He, he was told by Robert that I want you to go and do this. Uh, and, but... <laughs> His co-defendant, who testified against him, he had three prior felony convictions, including one of sexual assault, where he did in 1993, when he was just a young guy, and he did it to his sister's friend. So he had a prior record of doing this. And they say birds of a feather flock together. But they just gave him like a six-year sentence. And as, as Robert pointed out, he had gotten released and locked back up again. So it's like the district attorney, it's like they're making a deal with the devil by saying, oh, just testify against him. We'll give you a short sentence. Meanwhile, it's like he is a – you're just releasing a monster back into the streets. It's like, really? And that's just more proof. The DAs don't really want to protect people in, in many cases, right? They just want to – they just want to win deal trials. They just want to get things off the dockets. They want to be able to report to the news. Well, I convicted him. Not all the time, but it's a lot of the time. I mean, at least in this case, we had a... I think Gail is the assistant DA now. I can't even recall. Is she a victim's advocate or assistant DA, but she showed up. And then to add insult to injury, the part that just I think will make anyone mad is that on top of all of this, the assistant DA or the DA offers to drop him, drop the charge, the bill of assaulting a 13 year old girl. There's no one. We can't find information on it. There's not even a, 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 a thread of evidence of that on the Internet. But as Mr. Roche pointed out, and we know Mr. Roche does his homework. And that is sick. So if you think about it, what's being played out in front of all of us is a man who was a coach and a teacher who gets his student to then 
sexually assault his loved ones while he's participating in it who but already has a track record of doing that so he's he's a dangerous dangerous man they give him a six-year deal so he's out in the street to offend again which he does they then offer this man who sexually assaulted a 13 year old girl to just drop those charges for what reason for what reason why and during all that time he runs for and wins a seat at city council and how he said he almost won mayor he was actually he he was not exaggerating he held the position that whenever the mayor left town he was the sit-in mayor that's in this article over here it's the fancy word they use he would fill into the mayor whenever he was out of town <laughs> here's the i'll drop these links in the description this is all the it's 21 pages that went through and then he has his court of 30 34 uh, pages but i'm you know trying a, a new style instead of reading it over i i i i trying to rehearse it to you so if you like this format i've asked you a few times i've, I've gotten different responses some some seem to like uh some of you seem to like when i kind of read it but i don't know i feel like it's kind of grueling you know i don't like listening to me read so i don't know why anyone else would it takes more work to for me not to just read it takes more work i have to read it i have to digest it i then have to prepare it remember it and then speak it it's actually it's harder not to just read it but i digress i mean again i think my takeaway from all of this is that it was just like the da's like first at first you have you have he's been getting away with it probably his his whole life a wolf in sheep's clothing and you might then you know at, and and at his age he, he had done this at what at 40 was he was he 59 when he got when he did it was he 49 he said or maybe but um he's probably doing it his whole life finally gets gets caught and you might say okay well the system worked here he was he was in a place of power he was a councilman he was a sitting mayor and they still went after him you can say that but at the same time the da dropped those charges but then you can also say well we've seen da's do this all the time i mean so like but i don't know you take it for what it will he did get out that year but he he passed away um he passed away in 2022 pretty much right after he had gotten out his uh obituary says that he went on to glory on wednesday march 9th 2022. he was not survived by his mother so we don't know if his mother was able to hold him one last time and and that is the uh, I guess you can say another victim in the case. I don't know, but my heart broke for her. <sighs> Take it for what you will. This is... Uh... do another one 10 doc number 362622 you're classified as a second felony offender um, you were sentenced uh, november 26 1997 in orleans parish for armed robbery you received uh 
50 year sentence. And then as a habitual offender on November 26, 1997, armed robbery, uh, one count, 50 year sentence. Excuse me, on that previous conviction, it was three counts of armed robbery. Those sentences are running together concurrently. So the total DOC time is 50 years. Your parole eligibility date was determined to be February 5th, 2017. You don't earn good time and your full term date is November 13th, 2046. Is that information correct, Mr. Washington? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Jones. Good morning, Mr. Washington. Good morning. Tell the board if you would, uh, what the circumstances were in your life that led you to commit these crimes? Well, thank you. Being, being out on the streets, you know, um, and young, I was, I had a lot of guys that uh, looked up to me and in the process I led some of those down the wrong path, you know. I had people that was within their families that was, you know, I, I got it to the right spots within their life. But when it came down to me teaching the other guys who was out there on the streets, not doing what they're supposed to, I didn't do an adequate job. Now, I have you know, straight some of them. Mr. Washington, stop for a second. Yes, sir. I didn't ask you what kind of a leader you were, and I didn't ask you uh what kind of path you took people who followed you i'm asking you what led you to do this I mean, i'm not asking how you led others tell me what circumstances or people for that matter led you to um to commit a series of crimes okay i was in an area a crime infested area and in the process of me being in that area you know, I, I had to be around that. So I kind of picked up on things that was wrong that I shouldn't did. And by me not knowing the system back then, me being young, you know, it strayed me from what I should have been doing instead of doing what I should be doing. Uh, all right, now I'm a little confused. You refer to not knowing the system. What system is it you didn't know? The criminal court procedures, um, just the law in general, because I did I wasn't taught certain things about the law and I didn't know about the criminal justice system. So everything was by choice and by chance. And when I say chance, you know, by me not knowing, I didn't follow up. Which of your crimes did you commit without knowing there was anything wrong about it? Because I'm looking at the uh, illegal possession of stolen things, uh, and and I and maybe if you say you didn't know they were stolen. Uh, that's one thing, but armed robbery. Did you, you didn't think that was wrong to do it? Or against the law for that matter yes sir i did I, that i did know about yeah know and, about. and so what led you to commit armed robbery for example and I, don't tell me it was you didn't know the system no sir it wasn't that it's was just the fact that i didn't i wasn't one of the ones that actually pulled the gun on nobody and you know so i, I I was still wrong, but I wasn't that person because my nature is not to harm or make harm to anybody, but I was a part of that and I am no better than the next person. So I didn't actually have a gun in my hand, but I was in the car. Yeah, well, so if I give you a pass on the armed part, what about the robbery part? Well, the robbery part was we had, the guy had the car and, you know, we were jaw riding and having fun, supposedly having fun. 
when I knew better than at riding in the stolen car. Matter of fact, you had a set of keys made for it, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know that part. Well, I was looking in the record here. Um, well, let's um, let's go somewhere else. Tell me uh, what programs you have taken uh, with special emphasis on the ones that you thought you got the most out of. Uh, the JCs, Junior Chamber of Commerce. I've learned a lot because when I when I came to jail, I had low self-esteem and the JCs automatically taught me how to build your self-esteem up and to be confident. Um, I took... Uh, Go ahead. I took... Um, Crime holics, step study, I took uh, anger management, life skills, you know, all these things benefited me because it showed me a better life and how to be a better life and how to be responsible, you know. You know, it's just like substance abuse, you know, even though I didn't have a substance abuse problem, they always told me you don't have to have a substance abuse problem because it deals with life. Right. Um, so, um, Crimeaholics is a, is a, um, is a group that, um, follows a 12 step program. Yes. Okay. Uh, how about thinking for a change? Yes, sir. I have taken, no, no, I'm sorry. I don't think I took and think for a change. No, sir. That was something that was brought up within the last few years. Uh, I haven't been put on that call out. Did you ask to be put on that call out? Uh, no, sir. Well, how likely is it they're going to put you on that call out if you don't ask to do it? Yes, you're right about that. Um, what about uh, write-ups? Well, uh, you have um, uh, one of my colleagues noticed, and I had noticed this, that you have a couple write-ups since your last parole board hearing. Yes, sir, I do. Yes, I do. And you knew from that hearing, I bet, how important it is not to have write-ups. Yes, sir. Nevertheless, uh, you did. You have any explanation? Well, it wasn't because well, you didn't know the system, I bet. No, 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 sir. No, it did not. It wasn't like I didn't know the system, but when it came down to that part on one of the write ups, uh, I didn't have an excuse for it. You know, I, I should have known better because I've learned a lot more. And I am, I've become a leader in here, but at the same time, you know, I slipped. I slipped and it was a, and nothing I can say that can you know, bring light to that because it was, it was done not on a purpose, on, not on the purpose that to bring harm or to bring wrong to anybody, mm -hmm. but it was just something that came up on my aspect. And that I have apologized to to the officers and to the institute and to anybody else that needed to be, I apologize to that for that. Which, which write up you're talking about, Mr. That was, Washington? That was the write up in 2017, in December of 2017. The 20, the 21C? Yes, sir. Um, Warden Tanner. Yes, sir. Could we hear from you, please, sir? Um, uh, well, he has participated in a in a lot of programs, but I, I just have some concerns about his conduct record. Uh, I noticed that he's had uh, at least three, looks like maybe three, maybe four 
aggravated sex offense write-ups. I asked him about the, uh, he has taken this, the, in, enrolled in the sex offender treatment program and, and has cl completed as much of it as he can, being that he doesn't have street charges mm -hmm. for sex offenses. <coughs> um, but he has received that last write-up was a sex offense write-up and that's been since his treatment. Um, you know, he, he's, he's, uh, uh, Lon, you are a member of the inmate recognition program. Yes. Yes, yeah, so he, uh, he's, he is a member of, the, of our in, inmate recognition program called PRESS. Um, participates in the clubs in a few years without a write-up. Uh, but I, I just have some concerns about Lon. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Washington, what is your um, job there? Right now, I don't, I don't have a job. It's field crew, and I just help out where needed at. You know, during this pandemic, they've been using me to help out in different areas that I have experience at. And but I don't have a official job on my status. Okay. Do you have? Um, are you a trustee? No, sir. Uh, but you have trustees there, right? Yes, we do. Have you ever been a trustee? No, sir. What do you attribute that to? Um, I have too much time. Okay. That would be that would be right. His his his, his full term date would prevent him from being a trustee. Okay, thank you, Warden, and thank you for your uh, contributions a minute ago, Warden. Um, yes. So if you were paroled, Mr. Washington, what do you think you'd um, do for a living? I have, um, I have a skill in welding and that was a, one, of the, one of the areas I wanted to go in and that was welding, you know. I used to be a welding tutor back then, you know, in 2016. And 17, I was a tutor. So that was something that I wanted to attribute back in society was my welding skill. Okay. Uh, where did you learn welding? Here at RCC. Okay. Uh, are there are there certifications for welding that you can get? Yes. You have any of those? Yes, sir, I do. What is what certification? Oh uh, NCCER. It's a training course that certifies you for knowing all the uh, welding uh, safety laws and mm -hmm. things of that sort. And I have that. <clears throat> okay, good. When did you get that? I had, I received that in 2000 and if I'm not mistaken, 2014. All right, good. What about formal education? Do you have um, a high school diploma or a GED? I have a high school diploma. I graduated from Abramson High School in New Orleans in 1993. Okay, did you ever um, try to get any college credit? Yes, sir. I went to Southern University for about a year before this, uh, this charge that happened in New Orleans. How'd you like it? Oh, I loved it. <laughs> uh, if you were released on parole, where would you live, Mr. Washington? I'll be staying in Slidell, Louisiana. With? With my sister. Okay. Um, have uh, have you or has anyone uh, made any inquiries about welding jobs there? Uh, there is a, um, yes, I have. Yes, I have. Excuse me, sir. There is a, uh, 
a company, it is under the David Glass family in Madisonville. And I was planning on getting all, I think it was, it's called All, all, all Corps or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I was going to go there to submit an application because we try to go online to get one, but for some reason they can't pull it up online. They don't have applications available online. Okay. <clears throat> all right, Mr. Washington, thank you. I think that's all the questions I have. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Roche. Madam Chairman, uh, Mr. Jones conducted a very comprehensive interview. I have no questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, so this, the sister you mentioned is Ms. Daly? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And it's Arcosa Marine. Arco, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think, is it Ms. Washington that's going to be the spokesman for the uh, family support? If so, we'd like to hear from uh, the family at this time. Good morning. Good morning. I'm, not sure. I'm not sure if uh, Ms. Regina wanted to speak. If if not, I'm, I'm more than prepared to, to go ahead and say a few words. I can't hear you. We can't. I can't. I got it. I Who's Miss? I'm gonna ask Miss Roten of our staff who indicated they were gonna be the spokesperson. I can't see it on my screen. Um, we had the list here, Mr. Knox. One second. We turned the video off. Speaker. Is Miss Sturkey, but she's not on the screen at all. Miss Regina Sturkey, uh, Ms. Renata, but I think she lost her. She yeah, I did have her listed, but I don't see her. So we'll go ahead with you, Miss Washington. Go okay. ahead and tell us what you'd like us to know. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. I'm one of Lyme Washington's sisters, and I just want to begin by thanking the members of the parole board for making this opportunity to speak on my brother's behalf available especially during these unprecedented times. As most of us do, Lon made a mistake early in his adult life, but over the years he has grown immensely, spiritually and mentally. The past two decades have given him a lot of time to reflect and I know that he has accepted responsibility for his actions and is beyond remorseful. He has missed out on the opportunity to raise his daughter, to be at his grandmother Roberta Kennedy's side while she suffered from the ravages of a debilitating stroke and to comfort his family after the untimely death of his brother. He has also been unable to participate fully in the lives of his nieces and young granddaughter. We are taught that the prison system is meant to be a place where people pay their debt to society, are rehabilitated, and then rejoin the community as productive members. Lon has repaid his debt and is ready to make that next step. He has the unwavering commitment of his family. Our sister Keisha Daly has secured gainful employment and housing for Lon and we are all dedicated to providing the emotional and financial support that he needs to ensure his success. Therefore, we humbly implore you to consider Lon Washington for parole eligibility. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Um, I don't know that we've mentioned to you, Mr. Washington, in the record, we do have opposition uh, that comes from the district attorney's office. We have a letter in the record um, saying that that office is opposed to any reduction uh, of sentence or early release for, for Lon Washington. It's based on your criminal record as an adult that includes several convictions of crimes of violence, your status as a habitual offender, and a history of revocation. Um, just so you know, that's something that you need to be aware of. Uh, is there a statement you'd like to make to us? Yes. All right. Now's your time. I want, I want to thank the board for having their time, spending their time to review my case, you know, amongst this crisis we have. And I want to thank you all, you know. I'd like to say that <laughs> my time being here has inspired me to do better, to be better. You know, when I became when I became an inmate, 
at WCI, I had low self-esteem, but now I do not. I have high self-esteem. There's a lot of things about me that I want to go on, but I can't. So what I can say is that Ed, I couldn't be right here talking to you all the way I am now when I was first got locked up because it was the low self-esteem. So, you know, the JCs have built me up to maybe become a lead. I have every position that I had in the JCs that, is, is a, that was available that I achieved. I am exhausted rooster now, so I can only step aside and just help out. You know, hey, what can I say? But, you know, I have grown. I am sorry for the things that I've done. I am truly blessed to have the family support and friends that I have, you know, I work around these officers a lot here at RCC, you know, because they help me to prosper, to grow, you know. Some of them don't want to see me go because my work ethics, <laughs> you know, I have good, perfect work ethics, but they, you know, they want to see me prosper and they don't want to see me doing it here by spending my, the rest of my life in here. So with that said, you know, the board decided to let me go. This is to be my rebirth back into society, to teach, to learn, and to contribute to society in any way that I can. And with that, thank you. Well, you've given that some thought. You, you, you have mixed reviews from your multiple victims. Uh, some, some of them they could not reach, they couldn't find them. Uh, a couple say they're unopposed, but um, there's, there's one who is adamantly opposed, saying uh, Mr. Washington will com continue to commit crimes and be a danger to society if he was released. He put a gun to my head and stole my jewelry and purse. Um, how would you respond to that? I know you can't speak to your victims, but if you could, what would you say to your victims? You hadn't mentioned them at all today. No, no, ma'am, I didn't. And like I said, you know, once uh, that I'm sorry about the what I have done to these people. And if I could say anything to them, is to please have it in their heart to forgive me through the grace of God, because I didn't mean to have any harm or cause them any harm for them, for their family, for nothing, for anybody, you know? And I am truly sorry. I have learned my lesson and there's no more of this going back towards me. Everything from now, from here and now forward is all positive. I can't go back. I can't afford to go back. I'm too old to go back. Everything has to go and grow and I have family, I have grandbabies. Since I missed the life of my daughter, I have grandbabies that I have to keep, to teach, you know, to pro make sure that they prosper. So I implore to them, if I could speak to them, that they would just go it on and hear my plea wholeheartedly and let me be released. And with that, I'm done. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Is the panel prepared to vote? Mr. Um, Jones? Yes. Um, Mr. Washington, um, you've done an awful lot of good things in, um, in your time there. Uh, I see your press hat, and, uh, and Warden Tanner talked about that. Um, and you have uh, lots to be proud of, uh, but I share Warden Tanner's concern about your disciplinary record. Um, you have um, serious offenses and, and a variety of them. Frankly, you know, it's not, um, if, if you've been caught with a cell phone, 
10 times, um, that's one thing, but, but, um, but your disciplinary record is more diverse and more troubling than that to me. Um, I, um, I would like two things. Uh, number one, I would like for you to be diligent. You, you have been diligent about learning to express yourself, learning to have self-confidence, and those are learned things. And, and I uh, respect that and admire it in you. I, I, I need you to learn to be diligent in following all the rules, all the rules. Number two, I, I want you to think um, a little more carefully than you have about what it is that, how it is you came to commit the crimes you did and wind up where you are. And because I, I, I was, very concerned about the answer you gave to that question. Um, you didn't know the system, the criminal law system, and I, and and uh, and he, when you think about this, you'll see that that's a that's the kind of answer that gives me more fear than confidence that it won't happen again. Um, I. My vote is going to be to deny your parole. Mm. If you are denied, I, I encourage you to, to follow every rule and make sure you don't get any write-ups and reapply when you can and present a little bit better picture to us. But good luck to you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your, your vote. Mr. Roche. Mr. Washington. I served on your panel on May 24th, 2016. You were denied because of victim opposition, law enforcement opposition, and disciplinary conduct. You can't do anything about opposition. It's gonna be there. And I can overlook opposition because it's, it's always gonna be there. But I'm very disappointed because I remember speaking with you about your disciplinary conduct. And you've had two major write-ups since that last hearing. A total of 55 write-ups in 23 years. That is unacceptable. Primarily because of your disciplinary conduct and the quality of write-ups that you had in 23 years, my vote is to deny your request. Mr. Washington, uh, I, I do agree with everything my colleagues have said. Uh, you presented very well today. I, I too have shared the concern that Mr. Jones had about your response to what led you to your life of crime because your crime started as a juvenile you know, the same types of crimes, theft and all that kind of stuff. So you, you need to do some reflecting on that. But also uh, I listened to what Warden Tanner uh, said about your conduct record. You know, we, we, we Mr. Roche's mentioned the, the write-up since the last hearing, which is disappointing, but I am, I am a little concerned about it too. So I will concur with my colleagues and my vote also will be to deny, however, Heed Mr. Jones's advice. Be diligent in following the rules. You know, reapply when you're eligible to do so. It doesn't take, you don't have to wait four years. Yes, ma'am. You know, reapply as soon as you're eligible to do so. Stay conduct, uh, keep your conduct record clean in the meantime, and you may have a different outcome. But today you've received a unanimous vote to deny your parole. We look forward to seeing you as soon as you can uh, reapply. Family, thank y'all so much for participating today. We appreciate you taking the time Excuse to be with me. us. Excuse me, this is Lynn's mother. And um, I guess because we haven't about to have bad weather, I was knocked out. Is it 
anything that is it possible I can say something? Well, we, we've already rendered our decision and Miss Kimberly Washington did a beautiful job of representing the family. Yes, I'm did. sorry, I'm I'm sorry we lost you along the way. Okay. Thank you. I'll call you back up to my office in the wall, okay? That was actually one of the, the most empathetic I've heard Renata towards uh, family members. You know, she she typically I'd expect her to just shut it down and say, sorry, it's too late. But she added the nice little detail there, and I appreciate that. Now, <laughs> what I got to tell you, um, the crimes that were involved that he had committed did not come through on this hearing when uh you know richard highlighted this hearing as one to cover and it's because the information uh in the court con transcripts are so brutal and so horrific that um it seemed like one to point out but the actual hearing was kind of mm, uneventful maybe that's how it felt to me at least i mean except for the beginning how um how Keith Jones seemed to he seemed to to I mean it was kind of humorous where he 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 didn't get a kick out of him you know starting off with he didn't understand the system and uh, then when he spoke about the write ups he's like oh is that also because he didn't understand the system and uh, I got I did get a kick out of that but then you had the four aggravated sex offenses in prison and to me that is just the such a big red flag I. Uh, and then it's hard to understand he didn't have anything like that outside of prison. And, you know, we don't exactly know all the details of that, but but the idea that if you're doing that in prison and then to be released and what, I mean, like, how can, but they didn't, they didn't release him, but it's just, now he, let's, if you want to go into the details of the crime, it's, uh, it's just terrifying. You know, he says, well, he wasn't the one with the weapon. Uh, but you get, so the first woman that they robbed in, it, it, so it involved four separate robberies. The first one occurred on 1996 uh, when, when uh, Janet Gibson and her boyfriend, they testified that they were returning home in the car. She was two blocks from a house when she realized that a car was following her. She parked in front of her house and the car that had been following her pulled up and then blocked her in. A man jumped out and put a weapon to her and ordered them out of the car. She testified um, that she started honking her horn. And when she did that, you know what they did? He fired the weapon twice. She threw herself over her two-month-old baby that was in the car. These men pulled up, boxed her in, and shot twice when she had the audacity to honk her horn with the two-month-old. And this woman jumped over to, to cover the baby. That was just one case. The next case occurred November 5th, 1996. So what was that? Like uh, two weeks later or so? She was driving home. When... When uh, when a car pulled alongside her and she saw two men jump out. And each of them went to the side of her car. So she got out of her car and one of them had put a weapon against her chest. Reach for her purse. Miss Waters begged. She said, please don't. It's my birthday. Well, her objecting and saying it was her birthday caused him to shoot her three times once in the chest and twice in the left leg because it, because she said please don't it's my birthday
Here's another one. Oh no, this is the same one. Then she they ordered her boyfriend out of the car, put the weapon to 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 his head, and uh, he testified that uh, they asked for money. He felt around his, and they were feeling a. Uh, um, felt around his body while he was hearing Miss Waters yelling that it was her birthday. And he testified that the men um, who had the weapon and fired Miss Waters, Curtis, testified that one of them had a bandana covering his eye. And they, they spoke about that. He wasn't able to positively pick them out of photo lineups because they, you know, had, they were covered with. The third incident happened November 13th, 1996 where they were dropping off, uh, she was dropping her off at her house when a car pulled up, a man got out and pointed a shotgun out of the window and ordered her and the others out of the car. When they exited the car, the three men got out of the other car and surrounded them. She also stated that two of the men wore masks and a bandana. The three men demanded her purse and jewelry and she gave it to them. One of them threw her to the ground, took the wallets and watches while they kept the shotgun pointed at Miss Gallardo's chest. The fourth robbery occurred November 13, 1996. So this is all in the same period of like a few weeks. At 3 a.m., uh, Miss Mullins was returning home from work, just, you know, a hard day at work, doing the, the, the late night shift. Oh, it was a man when he heard a car pull up and he saw some men, one of whom had a sawed off shotgun and wore an old man's rubber mask. How scary is it that an old man's rubber mask and a shotgun at 3 a.m., if you can get any more terrifying than that. They asked for money. He said, I don't have any money. I, I only have a beeper. So they rifled through his pockets. They took the beeper and they left. He called the police. So what we just discussed was four robberies, two of them where they shot a woman, one who said, please, it's my birthday, and the other who honked the horn. And we didn't get that information in this case. Instead, it was, oh, I didn't understand the law. Oh, it wasn't me. I, I didn't do the, the armed robbery. Uh, this was no, you know, there, there are some armed robberies I hear about where I said, you know what, 50 years is just because they put anything in a bucket. You, you can have a, a pocket knife and get 50 years for armed robbery. You can have a fake weapon and get 50 years. You cannot even have a weapon, but pretend to have a weapon and get the 50 years. And this is not the case. This is, I don't know why it's not, why it's, I, I don't know why he didn't get a much more severe penalty, frankly. It's attempted, it's attempted red rum. I, I don't really understand it, but yeah, kind of scary in my opinion, uh, especially with the offenses um, that he received in, in prison, those write-ups. But, and this is why we go over the info. Thank you, Richard, for providing it. We can go jump into another hearing. For Joseph Lede, Jr., DOC number 218464. You are a second class offender and decent behavior with juvenile carnal knowledge of juvenile. Sensed on July 7th, 2015. Count one, 10 years, Louisiana Department of Corrections. Count two, seven years, Louisiana Department, uh, to run concurrent. May 21st, 2019 is parole date. Not eligible for good time. Full term date is not May 21st, 2024. Does that sound correct? Yes, sir. Please answer, Mr. Jones. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Bay. How are you? All right, sir. Um, tell me what you would have to say to your victim if you could speak to him today. That I was sorry for what I was, what I did. Uh, I should have been the grown up in that when that took place. 
and uh, and I really am sorry to him and his family. This shouldn't have never happened. Yeah. Now, what um, when the police were investigating, um, your victim was a runaway. Yeah. And um, and the police said that, or one of the neighbors said that you always had little boys around your house, particularly runaways. Is that true? No, sir. No, my roommate was gay. I worked, I worked graveyards and he had uh, guys that would come over. So I, I never did have anybody come over in the, in the daytime. Um, I usually, I usually work, uh, sleep during the daytime because I work graveyards. Mm -hmm. So if anybody that would come over was coming over to see him, not me. Um, well, uh, what was the nature of the, um, contact you had with this victim well it all started back when he was 12 years old him and his, his foster mom wasn't getting along so i went up to uh, the juvenile detention and his uh, juvenile officer had put in a stipulation on his paperwork that if him and his stepmama didn't get along he would come stay at my house for a little while and then she got mad at me because she found out my roommate was gay so she stopped it and I haven't seen him in three, four years, I guess. And then he just showed up at my doorstep one, one day. I told him he couldn't stay. He said, well, my mom kicked me out. I don't have no place to go. I said, you can't stay here. And he kept on saying he didn't have a place to stay. And so I let him stay. I mean, I shouldn't have. That's why I said this is some of the time I thought I was doing something good. And, and well, Mr. Lede, you didn't, you didn't get charged with letting a kid stay at your house, no, no, did you? No, sir. No, sir. And did you plead guilty to these charges? Yes, sir. Because I didn't want to. No. Carnal knowledge of a juvenile doesn't have anything to do whether they're staying at your house or not, does it? No, sir. It sure doesn't. No, sir. No, sir. So you kind of glossed over that part, right? Well, I'm, I was, I was, I was. I was coming to it. I was coming. Were you? Yeah, I'm sorry. I probably took too long. It sure took you a while to get there because we were back at, you made a mistake letting him stay at your house, maybe. That was your big mistake. Yeah, that was my big mistake. Well, no, it wasn't, Mr. Bidet. Well, yeah. Your big mistake was when you That's abused it. this child. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. that was my big I mistake. I don't have any other questions for Mr. Bidet. Ms. Uh, Wise. Uh, Mr. Lede, good morning. Good morning. I saw where uh, you're being seen regularly by the psychiatrist. What's going on? Uh, just, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I really couldn't tell you exactly what it is. Just having anxiety attacks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you, Do you know what the diagnosis is? Well, uh, no, ma'am. I sure don't. Okay, uh, but but it is helping. Yes, ma'am. She got me on some medication. Oh, okay. You are on some medications. Okay. And you are, you're taking it every day? Yes, ma'am. Good, that's good to hear. Uh, I do want to inform you as a part of this process, we reach out to the law enforcement community where you were convicted to get yes. their opinion about early release. And like I said, there's nothing you can do about it. But yes. I just want to inform you that the, uh, there is some law enforcement opposition. And uh, and one of the, one of the uh, law enforcement officials indicated that you had a history of sexual related offenses as one of the basis for their uh, you know, for they are denying, for they are denying, opposed in your early release. Yes, ma'am. You've served about five of the of the ten year sentence. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. I think it's five. Yeah. You had some medical concerns in 2016. What was going on? Uh, say that again. I'm sorry. Medical concerns in 2016. What was going on? Uh, I have neuropathy, high blood pressure, uh, uh, glaucoma. Oh, okay. I've got a lot of. I'm trying to think of oh, okay. I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That's all I had, Chairman. All right. Ms. Lede, would you like to make a statement on your behalf? Uh, we didn't yeah. hear from the ward. We didn't hear from the ward. Uh, yeah, I was, I was going. Uh, okay. <laughs> Would the ward like to make a comment? Yeah, he has zero programming. He lives in a cell block. His last write-up was in March 22nd of 2018. He, involved in nothing all right thank you would you like to make a statement on your behalf mr Lede? 
Uh, yes, sir, if I could. Uh, I just wanted to say that I'm sorry. Uh, uh, especially to the to the uh, to Mr. Jones, because I, I know he had asked me a question and I was just dragging it on. I, I'm just nervous. Okay, I've, I've never been in this kind of trouble before. Uh, you know, they, you say that I had other charges like that, but I never was convicted of anything. Uh, the only thing I was convicted of was in uh, 87, that was up in Minnesota. And that's the only other crime that I have. My, my problem is I try to help too much. I try to help people too much. And, mm -hmm. and right. I think that's what my most problem is. But I just want to apologize to, to Mr. Jones for sure for not, asking, not answering him efficiently as I should have. You know, because what I did was wrong, and, and like I said, it, it uh, I think about it every day. That's, you know, uh, God said when you, when you forget, when he forgives your sins, he forgets it. Well, I can't forget my sin because I don't want to forget it because I want to make sure I don't do it again. That way I can try to live my rest of my life as peaceful as possible. All right. Okay. Thank you. Do you prepared to vote? Yes. Mr. Jones. Um, Ms. Leday, we may be in the mercy business, but we're not necessarily in the forgiveness business. Yes, and, uh, and so that's not anything for us to concern ourselves with. Uh, I admit that I get extremely frustrated when sex offenders like yourself um, refuse to address their offense at all. And, and even now when you were apologizing to me for not having done it, your explanation was that you just tried to help people too much. You tried to help people. You didn't plead guilty to helping people, Mr. Lede. You pled guilty to hurting somebody really badly, something he'll suffer with forever. Um, so uh, for a fairly large number of reasons, including um, the report we were given by Warden Hooper and the reasons I gave, my vote is to deny your parole. Ms. Jones, Ms. Wise. Uh, sir, I concur in Mr. Jones. My vote is to deny uh, law enforcement opposition, uh, lack of programs and awards comments. Uh, yeah, two votes to deny your parole. Also, I'm going to vote to deny your parole. Do the, uh, you need programming, law enforcement opposition, victim opposition. Three votes to deny. Your parole's been denied. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kelsey? Ma'am. Are we ready to adjourn? Yes, we are. I really don't like Mr. Kelsey. I thought he was disrespectful to to Miss Wise there when she said, let's get a comment from the warden. I don't think that was cool. But uh, oh gosh, I mean, what did we just watch? Really, what did we just watch? watch it is clear that we have someone who is completely unaware of the problems that he has it in denial he has like what they had said multiple charges but this was only his second conviction and what do you think his first conviction was they said it you know they didn't get into that but he's obviously a repeat offender a threat to society completely oblivious to reality of any kind the neighbor said that there are children oftentimes around the home. And the way that he answers Keith Jones, and he kept doing it over and over and over again, even in his final statement, I am really sorry. I am really sorry for my big mis... Um, um, and I'm really especially sorry to Mr. Jones. Not to the victims, not to the child, not to, I'm especially sorry to Mr. Jones. My biggest problem is that I try to help too much. 
Now, who's? Who, let me ask you this: Who do you think the bigger? Who do you think is it, it should be held more responsible in this situation? Should it be the the person up for parole who harms these children over and over and over again? Or should it be the DA that only gives him 10 years? He will be out in 2024 when he completes his full sentence of 10 years. Mind you, this was two charges, including carnal knowledge. You can get life for that. Yet they did 10 years for one charge, seven years for the other, but to run to run concurrent. It was just a 10-year sentence. He's young. What's going to happen when he gets out? What do you think is going to happen when he gets out? Who's going to be to blame? Obviously, this, this person is not capable of even understanding the most common sense. I mean, th there's nothing there. It was my big mistake to always help people. You know, the warden had the mic drop moment there. The warden, the warden just came in. <laughs> He's in the cell block. He's done nothing. He's done absolutely nothing. And then he's going to be released. Well, it's a broken system that we have because this man has no business ever stepping outside in the free world ever again. But he will. In one year. It's unbelievable. I, uh, you just. You might not believe it if you didn't see it here, but here it is for the world to see. Our system is broken. This man should not have been given any type of plea deal. I just don't get it. Zero five five first class offender driving while intoxicated fourth offense since the, uh, on 8 18 2017 to 15 years parole date 8 3 28 2019 good time date 7 1 2021 and full term date 3 26 2032 does that sound correct yes sir all right would you please answer mr jones please Mute. All right. If, uh, if I pronounce your last name, Derwin, is that close enough? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, Thank sir. you. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, according to my good wife. Afternoon. Um, how many uh, DWIs have you gotten in your life? Uh, to be exact, five. That was my fifth one, the last one I had. My record from my rap sheet that I have, I have all the copies. They've messed it up so many times. They even had me as someone else before. Uh, on this time, oh, Lord. and uh, uh, I don't know, his, his, his face came out. 
Okay. Um, sorry, sir. It's all right. All right. I that's see right. you now. Um, did, yeah. Has it? Did it ever occur to you? And the and the first DWI I see, uh, as I recall, is a pretty long time ago. Um, Two thousand four. Uh, Two thousand four. That sound right? In 2000. From two thousand four to now, has it ever occurred to you that you might have a drinking problem? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, I. When, I, when did that occur to you? Well, I, the first two times I didn't. I wasn't by the judges that I I was in front of prior. Uh, they never told me that I can go get help about this, the drinking. And, and um, whenever I had a death occur in my family, I, that's that's when I had started having my problems. No. And I'm sorry, but that's not right. That, all the research shows that you had the problem all along. You may have become symptomatic yeah. when you had, had lost somebody or had something bad happen. Uh, one yes, solution sir. to your drinking problem sounds like would just be so that as long as nothing ever, bad ever happened to you, you'd be fine. That would be correct, too. Yeah, great. I mean, I've done, I've went, sir, I, I've went seven years sober without being told to do it. I've never, you know, asked for the help. I just did it on my own. This, this recent one was the last time, and that's when my fiance passed away. He was... I was with a Marine for 12 years mm -hmm. and he was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. And, um, and that's when I, I was upset again in prior, excuse me, prior to that, my grandson got killed coming back from Tallulah and I was fighting for my son's life and God gave me my son back. He didn't give me my grandbaby, but you know, maybe that was met. And yes, I did go the wrong way. I I admit to what I've done. But sir, I just thank God today I didn't hurt me and no one. Cause I do have mm -hmm. some friends that did get killed over this. And I just, you know, um, like this last time when I stayed sober, I drilled my knees my nephews, I got 18 nieces and nephews, 12 great nieces and nephews, and you know, and I talk to these kids and they looking at me, they don't want to make the same mistake. You know, you know, and and, I, I, and I don't want to make the same mistakes either. So uh is your plan if you were released on parole, your plan to stay sober? Oh would yes, be not to not have anything bad happen in your life. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Um, actually, I have a goal. I have a goal. I want to go back and mentor at the um, the DMV office. They have the classes and like the first classes and second classes. I'm like a real good example, you know, to some of these, these children for me to help them don't do this. How would you mentor yes. them? What? Well, tell, tell them. Tell them. Tell them don't do it. And just keep repeating that. No, no, don't, no, do it, don't do it. Don't do it. I would tell them my story. I'm sorry. Right. I would tell them my story and, you know, what can happen the next day, what can happen within the next hour. You know, um, I I would pull my heart to them and, and like I do now. Um, Ms. Derwood, what, what, um, what programs have you taken addressing the issue of substance abuse. Oh, I've, I've checked into the hospital, in Vermillion Hospital in Lafayette. I've uh, done that two times. Um, I, I, need, I, I knew then, and then I had a nurse. Well, I was having seen I'm, I'm talking about in prison. Stop. I'm talking oh. about in prison. What programs have you taken? Oh, oh, I apologize. Um, I reentry. I. Oh Lord, I took about seven or eight now. Reentry. AA a few times. About uh, four or five classes. The ladies was coming and going. Um what do you mean coming and going? They sometimes they couldn't make 
uh, the, uh, go to give us the AA meeting, they, you know, they would miss a week and or two weeks, and then they'd come back again, and then uh, they had stopped for a little while. So, um, but my classes, I've taken anger management, um, reentry, life's healing choices. Uh, I don't have the list in front of me. I took quite a few classes, so. And so, um, and, and, and I just so I make sure I have everything. Your plan, if you were released on parole, to make sure this never happened again, would be uh, to not have anything bad happen to you anymore, and to counsel and to go speak to people about how you wound up in jail because you drank too much. Yes, sir. That and some, um, and you know, go volunteer and and help um, be strong and not be in fear no more. Learn to handle things a lot more better. Like mm -hmm. you know, I'm prepared. I gotta bear my child when I get home, and I'm prepared for that now. Without you know, not I don't even want to smoke a cigarette no more. I've learned my lesson. <laughs> I'm a little too old to be doing this when my profession could be out there helping someone. Well, you were too old to be doing it last time, weren't you? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you were probably too old to be doing it in 2004, but, um, <laughs> but that's all in the past. I'm young at heart. I'm yes, <laughs> that's good. I, that's all the questions I have. All right, Miss uh, Wise. I have no questions. All right. Would, uh, Miss uh, Karen would like to do the speaking. Oh, wait, wait, for Miss Karen, uh, Warden, do you have any comments? No, I don't have any comments. Thank you. Uh, Miss Karen, would you like to speak? Yeah, take yourself off a of mute. Yes, as far as Susan's attitude, I've seen a dramatic change in her. And I agree with the judge on everything. She was way too old to be doing the things she did as long as she did. And I think God has used this time with her in prison to open her eyes to the reality of the situation with her life. But Susan's always been a very loving, caring, always there to assist you. But the drinking did get in her way. But my sister and I have been staying in contact with her pretty much on a daily basis and seeing and monitoring her attitude has been night and day. And I do have a list of all the classes in front of me that she's taken. Another concern we have is that she needs a lot of medical care. But as far as her attitude with the, the, the situation with the drinking, I believe that she's repented. I think she wants to be in a better place. I'm in church weekly. Uh, I make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm in a Bible class every day, by the way, which has helped her. She's been doing the same. And the only way to keep yourself straight and clean is by addressing the word of God and being in it every single day. And so with her, she's going to probably live in the back of my house. I have a nice uh, 800 square foot apartment in the back of my home. And I'm going to monitor her and I'm going to make sure she comes with me to all the churches. She's already agreed to doing all of this. And putting God in her life, I think, is going to be a tremendous asset to her. And I'm kind of like her mother, just to let you know. And I'm not somebody you can cross easily. And I'm not the type to say, if she went back to drinking, oh, no, no, I'm not going to play with that because I don't have alcoholism around my home either. And I like to keep a very clean environment. But as far as her attitude with the visits we've had with her on the phone, and uh, I'm a retirement specialist. I have a very heavy schedule. And her whole life, she can tell you when she's done anything wrong, um, I've tried to help her, but I don't enable her. So, so I expect the same type of situation when she comes to my house. And she has been through some very, very serious situations that I myself don't, I know I wouldn't go to alcohol, but I don't know how well I've could have handled losing my son, my grandson. She went through a bad divorce. And she, this last guy that she almost married, uh, he died of cancer and she cared for him till the death. But she couldn't deal with her pain. She did go to a hospital. She got psychiatric care. And that really was a game changer for her. And I'm going to recommend that she sees another counselor for that on a regular basis just to monitor her to make sure she's in a good place. But the only thing I can do is love her, support her. 
And with her being in my backyard, and I, she will be watched regularly and on a daily basis. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Susan, uh, one other question, Ms. Susan, tell me about your, that you had discipline what, back in 19, May of 19, what was that for? Um, oh, the uh, write-up, it was about a box to p organize my trunk because I didn't want my uh, canned goods touching my packaged foods, touching my shampoo, my toiletries, and you know, my coffee. Yeah. So and you, what, what, there was an argument between me and the inmate. I was there for six months and um and the lieutenant came and I I was asking her not to please don't write me up because it was just a small argument that shouldn't that got out of hand. Okay. And it was defiance. It was a defiance write up. Uh, yeah, 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 that's it. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, right. we got Thank you. All right. Now would you like to make a statement before we vote? Um, well, if, if, if this has helped anything, I know it's about me, but, um, it's about the girls in the dorm that I told them that they gotta be strong and have belief that they can really go out there and make a difference. And I would be more than glad to grab their hand and take them in and help them. Um. I've learned to control, have my fear, be step back from fear. Oh, there's so much I want to say. Uh, right. I've learned a very valuable lesson. I just thank God there's no victim, but I'm the victim. There really is one, and it's me. I victimized myself. I believe I'm saying this right. I humiliated myself. I humiliated my family. You know, I can't do that. That's just, you don't do that. No. I did it, okay. and I'm embarrassed for it, All right. yes, and I paid for it, and some. You know, and then I lost my baby in between because he came to Baton Rouge to be close to me and he had a heart attack and he he just wanted to be with his mama. He was 38 years old and I still have to go put him to rest, you know, and I'm, I'm okay with it now. I'm scared of it, but um, it's not something that's going to go away. And then from there, you know, I want to help children with broken homes and okay. whatever I can, you know, to help the people. But right now, it's what can I do? Everybody's running away from COVID. Yeah. So All right. maybe we I can get an ice cream truck or something and okay. help the neighborhood house. Yes, everybody's scared of shop. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is the panel prepared to vote? Yep. Mr. Keith Jones. Peter, when I, uh, I, I tried hard as I could asking you questions, trying to get something from you that would give me any confidence that you'd stay sober if you were released from prison. And nothing you said gave me that confidence. None of it. I've heard all this before many times. Uh, there, I'm an alcoholic. I've been sober 31 years now. And there is good. one way. Well, yeah, it's good. I say, saved my life. I grabbed that life preserver. But there's one way that's been proven that actually helps alcoholics stay sober. And if they apply themselves, they stay sober. And that's the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, yeah. And not, not once. Despite, despite every chance I gave you, did you ever mention that you might think about attending an AA meeting if you were released on parole? And that, and and I, I you know, I, I went through the things that you said you'd do to stay, you, you'd, you'd make sure nothing bad ever happened to you, which is about the most ridiculous notion I've ever heard in my life. I wish I could do that for myself. I wish I could do it for everybody. Wouldn't that be great if nobody, nothing bad ever happened to anybody? Yes, it does. Um, it does happen. To, bad things do happen, and and uh, and besides that, the only thing you'd speak to other people and tell them, "Look at me. I went to jail because I drank too much." 
and neither one of those is going to keep you from be, from drinking again. Neither one of them will. Um, I'm so sorry. That's not what I meant. Ms. Bienvenue, if, if um, the best, biggest favor you could do your sister uh, would be to order a copy of a book called Alcoholics Anonymous, known in the, in the program as the big book. Uh, doesn't cost very much money. You get on Amazon, have it delivered to your sister. And uh, Ms. Ren, you read that book and think about it and then start over and read it again. And maybe read it three or four times. And, and every time you read it, you're going to find yourself in those pages. I promise you. And, uh, and maybe uh, participate in the program there that's available. Start your own AA meetings. Ask the warden if you can do it once you know what you're doing. And, um, and maybe next time you appear before the parole board, you'll be able to give the board some confidence that the same thing won't happen again and this time result in the death of a child. So my vote is to deny your parole. Good luck to you. Ms. Perlwise. Uh, Ms. Susan, you, you are blessed in that your transition plan home is already set. Now all we got to do is get you ready for the transition home. You are blessed. So many people come before us, they don't have a good transition home, like transition plan like you have. So yes, let's just get you straight now. My vote is to deny as well. I think you need long-term substance abuse treatment. You have law enforcement opposition and you really need grief counseling. Uh, I, I'm gonna make a knock on the file right back when you're eligible for a rehear. Uh, you've only done three or 15 years. So give yourself a little more time and right back when you're eligible for a rehear. Good luck to you. Uh, you have two votes to deny. I'm also gonna vote to deny your parole for the same reasons as stated. You have three votes to deny today. Your parole's been denied. Good luck to you. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Well, that was a, a side of Keith Jones we haven't seen so much of. We haven't seen a lot of him, but he had some great mic drop moments in there. I'm pretty sure he's the man that Mr. Mirabelle refers to often when Mr. Mirabelle, Mirabelle says I, that he is a good friend that has been going to AA for, what was it, like 30-something years? Um, and Keith Jones is, as you can clearly see, uh, a huge advocate for it. The best thing you can do is order the book. Uh, you know, the, the sum up of that interview is really, it was all there in a nutshell. Um, the really where, where they just said it best. It's, you know, she got a 15-year sentence. That was her fourth offense. You know, and it, it just makes me want to wonder, you know, the hearing before this, we had a man who got 10 years for altering the life of a child. And she gets 15 years um, because you have to keep society safe. Her, her being out of prison is a complete, it's dangerous. It's a risk. I mean, the idea that she was able to get all those offenses and, 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 uh, until she finally got the 15 year sentence and, you know, you might just say, well, how is it that she still got five years more than the person who already altered the life of a child and who is clearly at risk of, uh, and I would actually argue that it's not if, but when and how many, and if he's caught. While the person who's in the DUI, it's, you might also argue, unless they're fully rehabilitated, it's it's not if, but when, but but then it's, 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 and then it's, will she get caught before she, you know, statistically does go and hurt someone. But, I don't know if you catch my drift, um, man, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Kelsey, he just like, he's like, yep, yep, yep. He's a, yep. You know, like his, 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 I, I, this is what I've come to the conclusion. Like his style, I think is good for parole revocation hearings. He just keeps it. He keeps the whole thing moving. He can get the whole process done, but man, I would not want him to be a, a member of, of uh, for me. It's just like he, you know, he's a physical therapist. Like that, that's his qualifications, a physical therapist, the governor, he must just be best friends with the governor. The governor said, hey, why don't you be on the parole board? And I don't get it. But 
Um, I, 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 I really did enjoy, enjoy uh, a Keith Jones interview though. Um, and she's, yeah, she's, I think what, what we would call someone who's just in denial and doesn't seem to, to, to get it, just doesn't seem to understand it. And I, I may have misheard her, but I think her final statement, she said that she wants to drive ice cream trucks to help kids. And if I heard that correctly, I'm like, whoa, I mean, you have four, you have no business ever being behind the wheel of an ice cream truck. That is just crazy. I don't know if that's what she said or not. I, I didn't go back and re-listen. That's what I thought I heard. Should we go back and re-listen? Okay. So... Oh, they definitely get that. an ice cream truck or something and okay. have a neighborhood house. Yes, Everybody's scared of shop. All right, sounds good. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. Maybe I can get an ice cream truck and help everyone who's scared to shop because it was, yeah, okay. I guess if, if that, I mean, that sums it up. If you, her plan was to get an ice cream truck and it's for DUIs and I re-listening to that, I, I paused it and then looked and re-listened and I, you know, heard how she had to bury her son. And that is, that is terrible. But also let's be real. That is, that would only add to the struggles that she's in to get release and then, and then had to come to grips with that. Um, and I think Keith Jones gave good advice to his sister, get that book and maybe your sister should read it too. But we saw a bunch of hearings today. I appreciate you being here for it. Hope we learned something. And with that, I'll let you go.